Well, as a pastor, um, there are some common questions I get, um, some common questions from different age demographics, but questions that I've become better versed at answering. And, and so one of those questions over the years has been more or less, how much is too much? You know, how much paycheck is too much paycheck? How much house is too much house? How nice of a car is too nice of a car? How big of a vacation is too big of a vacation? And so I I get the sentiment. I I know because as you read stories in scripture, like the rich young ruler, you can sometimes feel like, should I even have anything? I mean, is it wrong that I have a house? Is it wrong that I even have a car? And, And so what do you do with those feelings? And so then you begin to ask the how much questions. Well, I've used this illustration before. I stole this illustration from another pastor, but I think it's so helpful. I'm going to give it to you again. But in Australia, um, ranchers will tell you there are two different ways to keep cattle in the ranch. One way is through building a fence, and the other is through digging a well. And when you think about that, the how much question is typically a fence mentality. The how much question is saying, God, where, where are the boundaries and I want to get as close as I can, as long as I'm not over that thing. Like, I'm, like I just want to make sure I'm in boundaries. So how far can I go before I cross the line? That, that's a fence mentality. But another way of thinking about it is, what if Jesus is the well? What if you see Jesus as living water and you say, Jesus, how can I, with the resources you've given me, how can I step closer to you? And so today we're continuing a series where where we are looking at being a faithful steward of things like your treasure, your time, your talents. And what I want us to do today as we talk about our treasures is to begin to have this mentality of not where's the boundary, but how can I step closer to Jesus, right? And so to do that, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter six. This is right in the middle of the most famous sermon ever given. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus is teaching his followers how to have a kingdom mindset in every area of your life. How do we have a kingdom mindset? And specifically here, he's talking about our treasures. So he says in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And so when he says treasures, that is ultimately anything that you value. So yes, it is money, but it's also more. It could be your house. It could be your clothes. It could be your reputation. It could be a number of things. If it's something that you value, that would be your treasure. And so he begins with a negative command. Don't do this. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on Earth. And you might be wondering, like, why does he talk about moth and rust? That seems weird. Well, in this cultural context, um, people who were wealthy would generally collect it through storing up grain, right? Like, like, I need food. You might be thinking that's weird, but how many of you guys are like, I wish I could store up some chicken eggs right now, right? Because they're expensive. Like, so you, you collected your, someone's like, I don't, I haven't bought eggs. Like, they're expensive right now. So um, people would store up grain. Other people would, would collect fine clothing and also precious metals. And what Jesus is saying is with those things, like with precious metals, It's going to rust. It's going to decay with your grain. I mean, insects will get in there and destroy it with your fine clothing. Bugs will eat that as well. He's like, at the end of the day, the things that we treasure are all subject to decay, to disaster, to um, destruction. And so when you think about the stuff that you have, when you think about your treasures, the things that you find value in, when you think about it, you have to get to a point of realizing it's all going to fade away. I, re- I remember the first time I ever taught on this passage, I was in a small town in Georgia and a guy goes, that's why coffins don't come with luggage racks. And I was like, I've never heard that before, but that's true. That's a true, maybe that's a Southern saying, but like, that's true. You can't, like, you're like, I don't, I can't take this stuff with me. And so when you think about um, your money, if you're collecting money, like, well, it's subject to inflation. When you think about your, your vehicle, you drive it off the lot and then it's subject to depreciation. And if you think about your, your house, like a tree could fall on it. When you think about your job, you could be laid off. You could lose it. And so all of these things, at the end of the day, we know they won't last. 
And so what Jesus is doing is he's trying to get us to slow down and to evaluate our lives and to say, where are you investing your time, your energy, your passions? Where are you investing it in? And is it going to last? And I think common observation would show us that the things we typically invest in, we know won't last. And even though we know that, even though it doesn't take much thinking to get to the point of realizing that, typically, instead of stepping back and slowing down, we just keep pushing forward and we're exhausted. We're wondering if this life is even worth it. And Jesus is saying, I want to see a change. Like, I want to help you to change to something better. So it starts negative. Now, here's something that's really important. Have you ever tried to stop doing something? Okay, what Jesus knows is you can't just stop things. You have to replace them with something better. This is what we would call the expulsive power of a new affection. And what I mean by that is if you're like, I want to quit smoking, or I want to quit drinking, or I want to quit cussing, or I want to quit looking at junk, like whatever it is you're trying to quit, it's not as simple as just don't do it. It's, hey, stop doing that, but let's replace it with a greater affection. And so Jesus is saying, hey, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. But the next thing he does in verse 20 is he gives us a greater affection. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And so he, he's, he's showing us that there's a better way to live. Now, I want to point out that stuff isn't inherently bad. Like the things of this earth, God, when he creates the world, he's like, this is good. Like this is good stuff. So we do not want to demonize stuff. If you walk out of here and like, I don't think I should ever own any clothes, like, like, don't war- like, that's not what I'm trying to say. But we need to know is that while stuff isn't inherently bad, sin, sin in our hearts gives everything that we have the potential to become dangerous for us. Right? So stuff isn't inherently bad, but sin in our hearts gives it the ability to become dangerous for us or not good for us. So we need to ask the question then is, okay, well, if, if having stuff's not bad, um, what does it look like or how do I store up for myself treasures in heaven? Right? Like I want to I help us to wrestle with that or not, not just to wrestle with it, but to, to clarify it. How do you store up for yourself treasures in heaven? Well, one of the ways we do this is through the way we use the things God has given us of this earth for a heavenly purpose. So one of the ways that you can begin to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven is through the way you use the things that God has given you that are of this earth and use them in a way that's for a heavenly purpose. Where, Where you begin to look like, okay, God, if this house I'm living in is ultimately not mine, but yours, how can I use my house so that people can know God, to know that he's good, to know his love, to experience his grace? Um, How can you, if you're like, okay, God, if, if my car is not my own, it's yours, like, what does it look like to say, okay, how can I use this for a heavenly purpose? Like, is there a way for me to use this so people can come to know the love of Christ and to find salvation through, through his life, death, and resurrection? Is there a way for you to say, how can I use the, the, the gifts that I have for, for making the places I'm in look a little bit more like heaven to come? You see, we, we begin to say, like, how do I use the stuff that I treasure, right? How do I use the things that God's given me that are of value in such a way that they're used for a heavenly purpose, Okay, so he's given us a greater affection to spend our life not for ourselves, but for heaven. All right, continuing in verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness." These verses are about focus. What we need to know is the things we focus on will ultimately direct our hearts. The things we focus on will direct our hearts. And so, so I think about it like this, like a sunflower. Do you guys know which direction sunflowers point? Pick the sun. Is this right? Is this a trick question? It's like, like, it's so like so if the sun's shining, if that's the treasure and you're the sunflower, you're going to look 
to where your treasure is. Or think about magnets. Magnets have polarity. You have the north, the south. You have negative, positive, whatever you were taught as a kid. But you know that if you take a magnet and hold it near another one, what can you do? You can drag it along. You can move it. And so, so we need to know is like their treasures, the things that we value are magnetic and they pull us and direct us. And so when I say they, they direct our hearts, what I'm talking about is they direct the things that occupy, occupy our minds, the things that we think about, that we focus on. They direct the way we feel, where our feelings rise and fall. They direct the things that we do, our behaviors. You see, the things that we focus on will direct our hearts. So we need to ask questions to evaluate what is our treasure? Because I think a lot of us, if, if we were to really dig in, we might be surprised that there are some things that would qualify as treasure that maybe we're not, we're not even aware of. And so think about, like, where are you searching? Where are you searching for status? Where are you, where are you searching for approval? Like where, where are you searching for security? Where are you searching for your purpose? You see, those types of questions of like your, your status, your approval, your, your, your security, your purpose, like those types of things will help to reveal what your treasure is. Are you, are you finding those things in Jesus, and what he has done and what he says about you? Or are you trying to find those things in your work? Are you trying to find those things in your reputation? Are you trying to find those things through your, your lifestyle? Another thing to think about is, you know, where does your mind go? When, when you, you know that moment in the day when you can finally sit down? Where does your mind go when you have nothing else to think about? What, what, are you immediately Googling something? Are you immediately daydreaming about something? Like that, that can help you know what you value, what you treasure. Um, think about your emotions. Like when I say that, I've, I've heard it said that women are emotional and guys aren't. They're like, women need to know about their feelings. And like, I heard a, a woman one time speak and she goes, false. She's like, you know what I've never seen a woman do? I've never seen a woman take a remote and throw it across the room because of the result of an 18 to 20 year old guy throwing a football around. She's like, she's like, men are absolutely emotional beings. All right. And so, so like we're all emotional beings. And so there might be things that like when it happens, you find yourself and just you're blowing up. Like your week was fine, fine, fine. You're doing good. Then something happens. And all of a sudden you're like, where did that anger come from? Or your life is fine, everything's good, and then you lose something, and all of a sudden you're like, I don't even know if life's worth living anymore. Like, what that's doing, that, that emotional awareness is, is helping you to see where, where your treasure is. Right, so we need to ask questions and evaluate, like, where is our treasure? What are the things that we're valuing? Because those things will direct our hearts. They will have a magnetic effect in the way that they pull our lives. When he talks about the eye, he says the eye's good or the eye's bad. And so a, a healthy eye, an eye that is good is an eye that's focused on Jesus. Because when you're focused on Jesus, that flows out of your heart and into all the areas of your life, and you begin to live more like him in the world that we're in. But if your eye's bad, like notice, notice that the word eye is singular. It's not eyes. If your eyes, plural, are good, or if your eyes, plural, are bad, it's singular. What Jesus is doing here is he's saying there's only one way. You have a single-minded focus. It's either on the things of this earth or it's on the things of God's kingdom, right? And you can't have a both-and approach. That's why it's a singular eye. And so I think about there's this docu-series on Netflix called The Mind Explained, it's fascinating, but one of the episodes is on time management. It's like everyone wants to maximize the time that they have. And one of the things it talks about is how it is impossible to multitask. So it shows a video and it's this guy jumping on a trampoline and he's bouncing and, um, and then it stops and he goes, okay, I want you to focus on the guy jumping and count exactly how many times he bounces. Go. And then it plays and he starts bouncing and you're like, one. Does a butt bounce count? I don't know. Three. Like you start, you're like, you're counting. You're like, is it feet behind? I don't know. And so you're counting it, then it stops and it goes, how many bounces did you count? If you counted 11, you were right. But did you notice the gorilla that walked onto the screen 
And you're like, what? And you rewind it. And sure enough, here's this gorilla like walking on and then dancing off. You're like, what in the world? Like, how did I miss a gorilla? And so the thing is like, you can either see the gorilla, but if you did, you had no ability to accurately count 11 bounces or you could accurately count 11 bounces and then not see the gorilla. But doing both wasn't an option. It wasn't a possibility because you can't multitask. Right? You can only focus on one thing at a time. What Jesus is saying here is you have a single-minded focus and you can't divide it. You can't can't be half focused on the things of this earth and then half focused on Jesus. You're either fully focused here or fully focused there. So he's saying like, I want you guys to be focused in on God's kingdom. I want you to be focused in on Jesus. Okay. Then verse 24, he, he wraps up this part of the, the sermon by saying, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, we could go really deep into this verse, or we could kind of give a a surface level view at it. I'm going to keep it a little more surface level. Um, What the main idea of this is, it can be summed up in, if you come to my house, I have a massive dog, but he's just a pitiful, frail thing of what he once was. He's 14 and a half, and he was supposed to live like to be eight to 10. And he's still kicking. I'm like, how? All right, but when he was, he's in Newfoundland. And when he was, when he was young, he was like 150 pounds of just stud. I'm like, look at this dog. Like, like, he, like he was massive, hairy, big. And, um, and when I would walk him, there'd always be that old guy that'd be like, you walking that dog or is that dog walking you? Like, like ha, 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 I've never heard that one before. All right, you know, like, and so, but the idea is like, what he's getting at, at a surface level, a quick view of verse 24 is, Are you walking your money or is your money walking you? And so the the truth is, is like sometimes you you hold your possessions, you hold your treasures and you're leveraging them for God's kingdom. But for most of us, the truth is, is like our treasures are actually holding us and they're dictating the way that we live our lives and we feel enslaved to them. And we we could get deeper into that about how we could become enslaved to our treasures because they hold us, but... Let's just, let's look at one takeaway. Okay, so the the big takeaway from from this text is that we should use the things God has given us that are of this earth for heavenly purposes. That's the, the big takeaway today is that we should use the things God has given us of this earth for heavenly purposes or for his kingdom or for his glory. In verse 22, when it's talking about the eye, it, my, my translation uses, uses the word healthy. Um, some translations will say good. Some will say generous. Some will say simple. And so it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful word that, that has a lot of meaning to it. And so people debate, well, is it simple or is it generous? Is it good or is it healthy? And I heard one pastor say, this idea of a healthy eye is actually where generous and simple overlap. The generous person doesn't overcomplicate things. They simply give and expect nothing in return. They give and they're not expecting people to owe them. They give and they're not expecting God to be in debt to them. They they just give. And their motivation for giving, their motivation for being generous isn't to be blessed, but to bless. And so we wanna be the type of people that are using the treasures that God has given us and leveraging them for a heavenly purpose. Because Jesus knows that if you are singly, if you're single-mindedly focused on God and God's kingdom, then you're going to hold everything you have with an open hand. If you're single-mindedly focused on God and his kingdom, you're gonna hold everything you have with an open hand. God, this isn't mine, it's yours. God, this, this, this house isn't my house. This car isn't my car. This paycheck isn't my paycheck. This, this reputation isn't my reputation. I mean, for me, like, my family, what does it look like for me to say my family is not my family? Like, obviously they are, but like, to say, God, you, you've given me them. Like, my treasure, like, think about like the things, what, how do we hold, how do we hold these things with an open hand? Well, we could go into each one, and, and I hope that you guys will. 
But to wrap up, I want to drill in on money for a second. And I want you to hear this clearly. Treasure is so much bigger than money. When when I'm talking about your treasures, it is so much more than money, but your finances are a huge part of your treasures. So let me just drill in here, right? If we want to be generous with our financial resources, we need a plan for generosity, okay? I I took this from another guy, so don't, like, not my my alliteration, but but a plan for generosity, so P-L-A-N. The first thing we need, if we want to be generous with our financial resources, is we need to pray to have generous hearts, We need to pray, God, would you make my heart generous? And so when you look at Christians, um, some Christians give and some Christians don't. And when you look at why, why would a Christian not be generous? There's two reasons. There's only two reasons why a Christian wouldn't be generous. The first is that they haven't been taught. Like no one's ever taught them. Okay, And what's crazy is if you look at um, studies that are out right now, they would show that in the church world, Christians that grew up in the church. So if you're like, I, I, was, I grew up in the church and you're 40 and older, right? 40 and over. Typically, you can assume that a Christian who grew up in the church that's over 40 has learned basic things like how to pray, how to study their Bibles, um, the importance of giving. But what they found is that if Christians are 40 and younger, whether they grew up in the church or not, 40 and younger, you can almost assume that they don't know how to study their Bible, that they don't know how to pray, that they don't know how to give. And so the truth is, is like, we might, we don't talk about money a ton, and it might be a disservice because a lot of people need to be taught. But a second reason why people don't give is they just don't have a generous heart, or their hearts are choosing to be disobedient. They're like, "I'm, I'm just choosing not to do what I know I should do. And so wherever you're at on that scale, I've never been taught, or I'm, my heart's being disobedient right now, we need to pray that God would move our hearts to be generous. God, would you make me a more generous person? Okay, so, so first, pray for a generous heart. The second thing is it's important for us to limit our lifestyles, okay? That's something that my dad did such a good job for me as a kid. I remember um, seeing other, uh, he was in the Air Force, and as he climbed the ranks to lieutenant colonel and colonel, like I knew he was doing okay, but I would see other kids that had dads at the same rank and they had boats and they had cooler houses and cool. And I was like, why aren't we doing that? And my dad was living below his means and modeling that for us. And so, so if you live above your means, I believe Dave Ramsey says, if, if you, the average American spends $1.3 to every dollar made, which means everybody in here is in debt. Um, But when you think about that, if you're living above your means, you have no margins to be generous. Or if, if you're living at your means, you have no margins to be generous. So what does it look like for you to say, I'm going to limit my lifestyle to allow myself to have margins of generosity? So limit your lifestyle. A, a third thing is accountability, All right? Accountability, what that looks like is when you set goals financially, you're like, I need, like, I need, some, I need some financial goals. And one of your goals is to have margins to be generous the only way you can do that is through a budget. Like, and maybe you're like, I can do it without one. You're special, but most of us can't, all right? Like, if you want to, to have a goal of having margins to be generous, you have to live through a budget and to have that accountability and to have someone that will help you and hold you accountable to what you've set, whether that's your spouse and you're doing monthly or bi-monthly check-ins, whether it's a financial planner or someone that, like a mentor that you can say, hey, would you ask me the hard questions about how I'm spending my money? All right, but you need accountability. And then the third thing is, is I would say no less than a tithe. And I know this can get controversial, controversial um, because if you read through the New Testament, there's no command to give a tithe. Sometimes people throw that at me. They're like, you know, the Bible doesn't say you should tithe. And um, I'm like, I've never read this thing. Like, what? And I'm like, no, like, I, know, I know that. I know the New, the New Testament doesn't command you to tithe. Um, if you read through the Gospel of Luke, you'll see 10%, you'll see 50%, and you'll even see 100%. Like the rich young ruler, give it all away. Zacchaeus, the wee little man, 50%. Like, it's like, so you look at it, you're like, Jesus, what is it? Give me the number. And you know what the number is? It's a fence. And guess what Jesus doesn't do? He gives you no fence. 
right? Because his goal isn't for you to know the boundaries. His goal is for you to step closer to him. But here's what I know. In the Old Testament, the bare minimum was 10%. And so those in the Old Testament were giving 10%, and they, they only had a partial revelation of Christ. They knew they needed a Savior. They knew a Savior was promised, but they had no idea that his name would be Jesus. They had no idea that he would live a perfect life on their behalf. They had no idea that he would die a sacrificial death that they deserved. Like, they, they had partial knowledge, and they're given 10%. Now, we're on the other side of that with the full knowledge of who Jesus is. And I'm like, man... If we have more knowledge of Christ, should we not be more generous people? And so I would say no less than a tithe. Like start, that's a great starting point, right? To start with say like, hey, I wanna wanna live within a lifestyle limit of 90% of what God's given me and I wanna give the other 10% away. But as we look at this plan for generosity, we have to know that this is what flows from the gospel gripping your heart. You see, when the gospel message grabs hold of your heart, you realize that it's a message of generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. You see, the gospel story, when we know where it's going, it begins to change how we live. And so where's it it going? Where do we end? Well, the story shows us Jesus at the right hand of his father, with the infinite riches of heaven at his disposal, choosing to leave all of his riches and become poor. As he stepped into history, he didn't even have a pillow to lay his head on, but he becomes poor that he could live the life that we couldn't live, a perfect life. Then he dies in our place so that through faith in him, we could now inherit his eternal riches with him. You see, he became poor so that we become rich. So when we know what's in store for us, where we know where we are headed because of Christ, what that does is that allows us to begin to open our hands with the things we have. So my prayer for us at Redeemer is that we would be generous with our treasure, that we would live open-handedly, seeing it as God's to be used for his kingdom and not our own to hold tightly. And I think that's the type of church that that can begin to not only move the needle, but to really impact the world we're in. So let's be a more generous church, not because it makes God love us more, but because it's a reflection of how he's treated us. God, thank you so much for your word. And we know that at the end of the day, our hearts can't, our hearts don't have the strength to just become more generous people. And we can do our best, but God, unless we're gripped by the gospel, it's not gonna lead to true joy. So God, we we wanna be gripped by the truths of your love for us, by your grace, by your generosity. You got to see the blessings and the favor that you've given us that that are ours to hold. And God, we ask that that knowledge would surpass anything this world has to offer, that we would be a people who are living open-handedly, using all that we have for your glory and for your kingdom. It's in your holy name we pray, amen.